praise uh, you, Lord, and thank you, Jesus, uh, for allowing us to assemble and gather in this house of worship where we together can lift up the name of Jesus and give him some worthy and due praise. As a matter of fact, uh, he is the only one that is deserving of all of our praise. Amen. God is good. Come on now, don't let me have to talk to you. You should have come in here this morning with your heart already filled with thanksgiving. Amen. Everything that's going on in the world and in our nation and trickling on down into our local city and communities. And it has even broken into our homes and our domiciles. And, and, but yet the Lord has been good. Amen. Amen. I don't have to ask you what you went through this week. If you are here and alive today, I know you arrived here because you went through something. And whatever it was, the Lord brought us through. Amen. The scripture says that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Say, I'm a conqueror. We ought not be running from the devil. The devil ought to be running from us. Because whatever he puts in our path, we are a conqueror. Say, I'm a conqueror. You may not want to say it, but I'm just trying to make you say what you need to be saying. I am a conqueror. Amen. You may have been sick this week, but I'm well today. Thank the Lord. We're on the other side of COVID. That COVID took a lot of people out. But we're still here. Say, I'm still here. Turn around, turn around, and turn your neck around. If you got a cramp in your neck or a crook in your neck, turn your whole shoulder around and say, Hey, I'm still here. By the grace of God, I can't hear nobody. Still here. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm still here by the grace of God. There is a a call to worship scripture um, that uh, is recorded in the book of First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter sixteen, and beginning at verse number twenty-three, and I will end the reading at verse number twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. First Chronicles chapter sixteen. Beginning at verse number 23, ending at verse number 29. And David says, who is the writer, the penman of this particular chapter and portion of Scripture, he says, Sing unto the Lord, all the earth, show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathens, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence, strength. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring it all free and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come on, put your hands together today and just just shout it out. I come to worship the Lord. I come to worship the Lord. I come to worship the Lord. God, our Father, we pray now that you would manifest your presence and your peace and demonstrate your power in this place today. Bless us now that as we come, we are the offering 
that we bring to you this morning. And we offer ourselves to you in this worship experience. May you be magnified and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
the way we know. Uh, hold on to that. Stay on the bag of it. <laughs> and where I go, and whether I go, you know, in the way. Thomas said unto, unto him, Lord, we know not what thou said. How can we know the way? Jesus replied unto him all, said, He said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes no, no unto the Father yes, but by me. Yes, I read it here in John 14, first through six verse. Uh-huh. We're going to bless you. All right. All right. All
somebody's eyes. Holler at them through your eyes and say, I know God will. There's some things in life that we think about and we're not sure or certain of. But there's one thing in life you need to know. to know who God is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. and you need to know what God can do. Yes, 
knowing God that is knowing God that is from the two of Christians. Baby Christians, they want God to do what they want Him to do when they want it done. That's in maturity. But the poor Christians, what we want God to do, we know God will do it when He gets ready to do it. And when God gets ready to do it, we know that it will be done right, and we know it will be it will be done on time. Tell somebody, I know God will. Come on, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. You've been praying about something or some things, and maybe God has not answered your prayer yet. But I know He will. Maybe there's been there has been sickness in your body. The doctor's medicine is not seemingly doing any good even right now, and you've turned it over to the Lord. Somebody can say He ain't showed up yet, but I know He will. The hill chance of the church. He said, I know he may not come when you want him to come. But he's always on time. Question, is there anybody in here waiting on him for something? I can't tell you when he's going to show up. Whatever you're waiting on him for, if it's in accordance to his will, I can guarantee you that God will show up. What do you need today? What are you trusting him for today? What are you depending on him for today? Know if I just wait on him. Trouble all over the landscape. Killings, murders, gang violence, unusual temper. Hotter in many states and places than it has ever been. Flooding. Flooding in the gambling casinos. Fourteen plus people have lost their lives already in Kentucky. Because of unusual flooding, Missouri, various states around the country, I know God is a protector. We are not exempt. It's just that God is protecting. And if you have any sense at all, you, look like myself, need to be asking God, why are you protecting us? We're not deserving of His goodness. We're not deserving of His blessings. We're not deserving of His grace nor His mercy. But God just gave you another reason among the many why you ought to praise Him this morning. I 
know he will. I know he will. I know he will. Is there anybody else in here? No. I know he will. Come on, tell the Holy Spirit, I'm not praying this morning. I, I need you to do some things. I need you to show up with some things. I need you to change some things. I need you to empower me to do some things. I, I know he will. Not only did the song say, I know he will because he said he will, and he said he would. Not only did the song lyrics say that, but the Bible said that he will. Can you help me tell the person down your road? Just holler down at him. Come on, y'all, let's work a little bit. <laughs> just, just holler at the person down your road and say, I- I'm leaning. And I'm depending on you. Come on, speak the word this morning. He is my help. And he is my strength. Without him, I would fall. I know you will. While they were singing, I was asking one of the biblical characters, how do you know God will? There were several of the prophets jumped up and raised their hand, getting ready to answer my question, question, but David stepped in front of them. And David said, I know he will because I was for him. And David said, now I'm old. And I heard him say, he said, I never He said, I, I've seen some folk for Satan. He said, but I've never seen the righteous for Satan. You saw the seed that's his children and his children's children. You know, it pays for you to serve God because when you serve the Lord, it's going to bless your children. You know what you mean to say? Me for sure. The scripture is for Satan. Not for sin. Is there anybody else in here? In the you may not be sure, but you can see it in your life yesterday. That's my answer. I can say yes, no. But that's what to me. This is not my news that you're going to die, but you don't know that you're going to die. Solid 
Can you start one more time? I know you will. This time it helped somebody. I know this time it helped you this morning. I know you will. Some of us are going back to some situations that I can't just tell you to come to church to go to hear that sound. I said, what do you mean? And he gets his joints and gets his body ready for walking and running and chasing after him for the day. I don't know if you're the first time I do that, I do that. I see it to myself. Let me have the old creator. I'm not in the one that way. Let me tell you, when you look at the stress yourself, so, so I don't want to stop to say, I'm still going to see you right now. But I'm going to see you right now. I'm going to see you right now. I'm going to see you right now. I'm not through, but I'm a quick. Uh, when I think about over the past 50 years of this church life and ministry, I know who he is. He has done marvelous things for us, and we ought to be glad about it. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord Jesus. Listen, we want to encourage you. We're at the, uh, we're on the last, we're on the last coming to the end on the last strip of our journey for Project 49. And if you have not yet, and if you have not already, you may remember, we was asking every member, every member to give $49 toward Project 49, believing that God would uh, enable us to retire uh, two mortgages by the end of this year. You already know he has blessed us. We, we have retired one mortgage and, and we're getting ready to retire this mortgage. And if you have not uh, been a part you have not sacrificially given to Project 49, we would encourage you to do it as quick as possible. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 want, you don't want to say, look what we have done, and 
you may be one of the we that didn't do anything. If you don't have $49, give something. God has tremendously blessed and touched the hearts of so many of you who went over and beyond and uh, the $49 and some of you have given hundreds of dollars uh, toward that project and uh, listen, the Bible says when we talk about giving the Bible says when we give we are lending to the Lord. Now, I know you got some folk in your life that you have loaned money to and they ain't paid you back. But the Bible says, when you and I give, we are lending to the Lord. And uh, I've lived long enough to know that God pays back. He don't pay back just what you or I lend him. Uh, he always pay back with large dividends. Somebody is a witness in here this morning. So if you have not already, or if you choose to give even more toward that project, uh, we pray that you will let the Spirit of the Lord speak to your heart. Amen. And the Lord will bless you extraordinary. I, I want an extraordinary blessing. And, and my reason for wanting an extraordinary blessing in order that I can bless others. Amen. The Lord would do that. Won't he do that? And so uh, coming October, uh, it's going to be a great celebration month. And um, uh, we're going to just praise the Lord even all the way up until then, and then during that month of October, um, we're going to be celebrating each Sunday morning a great, great, uh, awesome slate uh, is being laid out and prepared for that celebration feast. Amen. Mm -hmm. And listen, um, for those of us who will, uh, you have just one last chance in this church history to take out a man in the souvenir book um, for 50 years of celebration. Take out an ad, say something on behalf of what God has done in the life of this church. Um, put, your, put your picture there if you like, because I guarantee you, um, 25 years from now, you won't look like that picture. So you may want to set up a monument uh, now, and when uh, that time comes, when somebody look at that, that that photo and say, "Who is that?" and you'll have to tell them, uh, not that that is me. You have to tell them that was me. Amen. A couple years ago, one of the teenage young people came in my office and they looked at my picture up on the wall and had a full head of hair. Uh, there was no gray hair. And um, I was looking pretty good. And they said, who is that? I said, that was me yesterday. Yeah. Amen. Tell somebody time changes. Time brings on a change. So I want to encourage you, you and you, and um, to join in, to embrace what we're trying to put together. Uh, we have an excellent uh, committee that is working hard and diligent um, in putting all of this together. There's a lot of work involved, and there are time uh, schedules or time frames that we need to they need to work within. And you can help them by meeting deadlines, amen? Uh, and I believe that the deadline for individual um, uh, persons to take out an ad is August, the end of August. Whatever that last date is of August, the end of August, yeah. end of July. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was trying to give you grace. 
day. <laughs> Today is the last day for any one of us as members to take out a name. But listen, I'm, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to uh, ask on their behalf. I'm, I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to pull. I'm going to pull my authority a little bit, uh, which would be grace for you. You need to stop out there today and give your name and fill out the application for your ad. Do that today. Today is the last day to do that. If you don't have the money today to do that, then here's where your grace comes in. You bring your money next Sunday. Uh, say amen, Pastor. Yeah, all right. Some of you, all of you got it today. You ain't fooling me. You know, you can take out the ad and pay for it today. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. He took, he's, he's uh, I think, should I say you took out or you're going to take out? Are you going to take out Reverend Johnson? Reverend Johnson of the Morning Star. He's going to take out an name. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. We thank the Lord for him. <laughs> thank the Lord for him. All right. Uh, we're still within time frame. Uh, we're praying that the Lord would uh, uh, be glorified and the Lord would be magnified. God would be honored in everything that he has done in the life and the ministry and the history of this church. Amen. At the end of service, we're going to be recognizing and honoring all of our graduates and um, um, uh, blessing them at, at the same time at the conclusion of service today. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you is our prayer. Come on, stand to your feet and, and uh, we want to continue the spirit of prayer for the Lord on the behalf of the person that is standing next to you. If you don't know their name, just slide down and ask them what their name is. What is your name? What is your name? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Don't ask them what to pray about. Just say, I want to pray for you. Uh, we, we're going to spend just a minute or so praying for each other. All of us need prayer. Amen. All of us need prayer. If you contact somebody down your road, just down your road, nobody is on your road, just turn around and, and just ask somebody very close to you. If you don't know their name, if you know who they are, uh, just let them know. Point at them if you will, please, and I'm going to pray for you. 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 Reverend, what should I pray for? What should I pray for them for, Pastor? The Lord knows what they need more than you and I. Praying for your family, praying for your health, praying for your strength, praying for your your financial breakthrough, praying for your grandchildren and your children. Praying for protection. All of those requests are within the framework and within the will of God. I need him. I need him. You need him. Just go ahead and whisper it out to yourself. I need him. I need him. Problems in your life, your money is not helping. Situations in your life, your education is not solved. God, we need your help. Problem in my community right down my block, all over my city, in every city within my state, in every state within the union. God, we need your help. So we pray, so we pray.
your soul. Come on, lift your voice. Everyone lift your voice and say, I need the air. Personality of one of our own associate ministers, Reverend Robert Peters. Let's pray for him and pray with him as he declare unto us what thus saith the Lord. If you don't mind, lift your hand toward Reverend Peters and says, Praying for you, Reverend. Let's receive now, Reverend Robert Peters. Thank you for the free preacher. Do you guys know me well? I just like to get straight in and let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Father. Father, your people need you. Father, you poured in me all throughout the week. And Father, I just ask that you give a fresh anointing. Someone here. Someone here needs to know that they can have victory in this life. Someone here needs to know that Jesus Christ is everything, and through Him, we can have the victory. Help us all, Father. Help us to lean upon Thy grace and Thy mercy, so that in everything, 
Christ is glorified and we just we just get to see how great he is for us. Father, we pray all these things in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 32. I'm going to read the entirety, well, well, most of it, 1 through 10, but I'm going to speak about for verses 6 through 10. Blessed, when you are there, just say, I'm there. All right. Blessed is the one who, blessed is the one whose um, transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. For, but for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through all my glory. Groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time where you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or the mule without understanding, which must be curbed by bit and brip pile, or it will not stay near to you. Many, and I repeat many, are the sorrows of the wicked. But our hope, but our hope, but our steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. I've tagged this part two, um, from failure to a um, bit of victory. Walking in your victory. Guys, you may be seated. Guys, I just love superhero movies. Someone always, there, there's always someone who overcomes odds and is victorious. And normally, normally that the main character has one or more a, um, a superpower. Flash, you know, because he got super speed to overcome adversity. And then you have a um, the Aquaman. Man, he got a, um, a super strength, and he can talk to fish and all that. And he's able to use that to overcome adversity. Then you got Superman. Man, Superman got all the powers. <laughs> he got all the powers. He has a um, the super speed, strength, uh, heat vision, he can fly, and he's got a um, the x-ray vision. But there is one superhero who had no superpowers. None. But yet, he's always victorious. His name is a, um, a Batman. Batman's got a tool. Those are his superpowers. Man, that Batman got a tool for everything. Man, and he encountered, like, the, um, the Rid Riddler, Bane, Joker. He encountered them all, and he's always been victorious because of his tools. But... Here's the crazy thing about, about, about Batman. He encounters things that you wouldn't even imagine, and you're like, how does he have a tool? For example, you, you know, because he'll encounter a shark, and somehow he has a, uh, somehow a, um, uh, Batman has a, um, anti-shark rope repellent. You're, you're like, what? What? Come on. Where, where does this come from? And then he encounters the lion, and he, somehow he has got a, um, anti-lion spray. You're like, where did he get that? And then, man, man, and then his room turns all black. And guess, guess what? Batman has a, um, a bat light. Man, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we had all the tools that we need needed to be victorious? Wouldn't it be great if when we encountered our enemy of Satan, world and the flesh, and we could be victorious. God, 
Guys, I'm here to tell you, as a Christian, we have the Lord who has assured us victory in every area of our lives. He gives us the tools to be victorious. Now, our text um, uh, is continuing the theme of trusting God amidst great failure. Where verses 3 through 5 is talking about our failure, our sin of not wanting to confess it. And sometimes, guys, sometimes life just hits. It really does. We don't always do what we should do. But then we read in 6 through 10, in such joy, um, and we, we are shown that, that we walk in our great victory. And I got three points, and then I'm done. Um, first, we trust in God's power. Two, we trust in His protection. And three, we trust in God's guidance in discipleship. So my main point, uh, first main point, we will be victorious as we trust in His power. Guys, trusting in God's power is an absolute necessity in the Christian life. we got to believe that God can overcome what we cannot. In fact, it's impossible, it's impossible to be victorious without this trust in God that He is, that God is powerful enough to take care of anything. This is our starting point. This is where we start. That God, that regardless of anything else, whatever I go through, I know God can take care of it. First, we, we see two things of how we're going to trust in God's power. First, we trust in His powerful defeat of our past, of our past failure. Look with me in verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time where you may be found. This word may be found is talk, talking about when I receive my forgiveness. That, that's what is going on here. Is that God has already de defeated your sin. And if He can defeat your sin, He can defeat anything. And the word I am not there. Therefore, just underscores that fact. It's referring to verse 5. I confess my sin. And if God can take care of your sin, the worst thing that you could possibly have, what else can He do? What else can He do? God taking care of your past victories is really what Him to propel you into future trust and reliance upon God. This is what it is that God can, will, and do exactly. He can overcome anything. The second reason why we can trust God. We trust Him for His powerful de de defeat in present dangers. Look with me in verse 6. At the latter part, surely in the rush of great water, they shall not re-reach Him. Man, the idea here, guys, I'm in a brook. I'm in a brook. And, and I see this tidal wave. It's just coming. It's coming at me, and there's nothing I can do. I can't run. I can't hide. And all we got, guys, all we got is we, we, we just plead to God, like, Lord, somehow, save me from, save me from my impending doom. Guys, and we just lean on God, and God, He comes in, and He lifts us up. To a place of safety and security, God does this and, and will hurt us in all. My question to you: What is your tidal wave? What is your tidal wave? Is it your bills? Are they stacking up? Are you getting like a man? Shut off no notices, and you're wondering, Lord, I need you to come. I need you to make things right here. Is it a job? Have you been off work? And and you are doing everything you can. You are you are a you are a you know, putting in the applications and nothing's coming. And man, and all you know is that you're having a hard time putting food on the table. You're having a hard time, and you're wondering, can I pay my rent? 
And all you can do is like, God, please help me. Please help me. Please help me, Lord. I'm here to tell you that whatever your tidal wave is, whatever it is, God can and will help you. Your tidal wave will not defeat you. Whatever it is, God will provide it. All you got to do is call on Him. That's all you got to do. Guys, our text is talking about a immediate danger. But I'd be dismissed. Guys, I'd be dismissed if, if we also need to trust God for the ongoing dang- dangers. Or sometimes God just, man, it amazes me. Uh, sometimes God just puts stuff before us. Man, and it's like, I, I want to give you some examples. So, so we know that, um, that David is anointed king, right? Right? He doesn't get the kingship for 14 years. And God don't tell, tell him, oh, well, yeah, because it's going to take 14 years. No. No, God don't do, do that. God don't tell us however long it's going to take. We just got to trust him. That's all we got to do. And then you got Paul. Oh, my goodness, Paul. Uh, Paul, in Acts chapter 9, God says, hey, you're going to be the apostle to the Gen- Gentiles. He just sent out to Acts chapter 12. Guess what? That's at least 14 years. At least 14, and I'm like, this is Bruce Ball, guys. He, he's a beast. He really is. And, guys, sometimes God ain't going to tell you. He just ain't going to tell you. Most of the time, at least with me, that he don't ever tell me. He's like, he's like Rob, even though you're going to have to wait for like five years. No, no, God don't do that. Um. Uh, let me give you an example. So, in 1997, in 1997, I'm saved. I'm turned, I'm turned from a God hater to a God lover. In 1998, I get my call. I was like, God, you got the wrong guy. You really do. You really got the wrong guy. Y'all have to understand. I, I had a speech impediment since I was in the fifth grade. It stayed with me. And, and to make matters worse. Everybody around me told me I got it wrong. Everybody. But but I had one one friend. Um, I love him to death. Uh, his name is Dwayne Brummett. And I've known Dwayne forever. Um, so what, what Dwayne told me, he's like, Bob, I don't know if you're called, but, but I know somehow if he did, he, he's just going to work it out. Man. Thank goodness for guys like Dwayne. I mean, but, but guys, um, things happen, and I thought, well, maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I got it wrong. A couple years passed, so I was like, okay, I got it wrong. I was mad at God, and I was mad at myself. Then in 2005, I get my burning bush. Oh, goodness. <laughs> for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 11.29, I just go, I have a one-shot vision, and apart from that three three years, I have not stopped. I have not stopped. Sometimes I can be something else, but (laughs) I have not stopped. And I didn't preach my first sermon until 2010. That's 12 years. I preached that in a, I preached that in a, uh, I preached that in a, uh, in a Presbyterian church. And God didn't tell me, Rob, you know what? You're going to have to wait 12 years. No. All we got to do is trust Him. And if God, my solace to you, if God has told you anything, trust it until that you find something else. Un- unless you get a clear man, man, this is that, hey, this, this is not from God. Okay. Prayer is the water that grows our faith. Prayer is that thing. It, it's where we are the bench warmers in Christ's wings. 
wins the game for us. It's where we get to see. It's where we get to see how great and glorious Christ is. We go from an ungodly schemer to a godly witness of Christ, of Christ, a you know, redemptive work in our lives. And, and we're just amazed. I'm like, wow, wow, God. You, yeah, you, you pick me and you do all this. And, and we're, we're just blown away. I want to give you maybe some helpful hints about um, things to think, think about as you pray. Give him all your troubles to God. Give all your troubles to God and believe that he can and will do something about it. Be obedient to God's will, even if you don't like it. No. And like this, that you become more like Christ. Lord, not as I will, but, but as you will. Guys, each one of us has not liked everything that God has put in our path. But all we can do is trust it. All we can do is trust and rely that, that, that God is the ultimate God is the ultimate a, a de- designer. And, and we know that when, God, when, when we trust God's guidance, that it's going to work out for us. Here's another su- suggestion. Praise Him for the victory that He's accomplished. So, there's this thing called spiritual a, a disciplines. And it, it's a variety of things. Well, most uh, books are saying that we got 12 to 4, 14. There's things like prayer, worship, and a lot, lot of things. But, but there's this one thing. It's called journaling. And the idea, think of journaling like a spiritual a, a diary. Where I'm writing down all my failures and all my victories. See, because... Brothers and sisters, because our mind is beautiful. I, I, I mean, because we forget so much of what God has done. We forget so much of what God has done. And what this allows you, hey, let me look back six months from now. And, and, so, and, and then the, we, we just get to come to God in a praise report and say, wow, wow, my God, I forgot all about that. I forgot that you did this, you did that, you did this. It helps us to create an attitude of gratitude. Be willing to be vulnerable with God of your need and willing to go in whatever direction He says, even if you're uncomfortable. Guys, brothers and sisters, we got to have an Isaiah 6 mentality to, to life. Why don't you send me? That, that's always my, my approach. Hey, Lord, what's the first thing I pray? I like, Lord. Don't send me to Alaska because I hate winter. I really do. <laughs> I really do. But, but of course, I'd go if he'd tell me. But, but I would need some extra grace for that one. I just would. Be, per- be persistent with God until you get an answer from him. Guys, life is like a puzzle. We can't see, we cannot see the A on the picture. We, we got all kinds of pieces in our puzzle. Don't we? Yeah, we got all kinds of things, things we know, things we don't. But because we can't see the picture, we can't see see anything. See, because I've got this piece in my puzzle. I call it the uh, I call it the uh, I call it the uh, uh, necrotic piece. God used it greatly to just really to de- develop me in a very. That's where I learned: don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. I mean, and, and I've been doing that for years. And karate people are crazy, so just it just kind of comes with prepared territory. But that's where I met Dwayne Brum Brummett. Now Dwayne Brummett, well, when I met him, he irritated me. No, he irritated me no end because Dwayne does everything right, and, and I've worked so hard, man. Be, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. But Dwayne is how I came to Christ. Dwayne is how I came to Christ. Then I got this other piece. I call it my, uh, I call it my, uh, I call it my, uh, my speech impediment piece. I saw no hope. I saw no hope in that piece. Maybe you have a piece like that where there, there was no hope for so long. For 20 years, 
for 20 years, I saw no hope. In, but now, but but now I see what God was doing doing during during that entire time. Then I got this other piece. I call it my um, I call it my uh, I call it my uh, you know, Presbyterian piece. God says, "Hey Rob, I need I'm going to go send you to the Presbyterians." I'm, and, and God's like, "Hey, they love me too. They just love me different. <laughs> they they are a crazy group." Uh, but you know that that that's what God was doing. He he uh, he had sent me, and then I got this other piece about about ten or fifteen years years ago. God God was like, hey hey Rob, I want you to hang out with some church plants. I want you to rub shoulders. I want you to learn about vision casting and all that other stuff. And and, and, and Rob and I need you to be more of a go get kiddo. And right now you're not. Then I got this other piece. Um, I call it the, uh, the multi-ethnic piece. Man, that guy says, hey, Rob, I'm going to send you over to a multi-ethnic church, church plant. And, and hey, and then you're, you're going to preach sometimes. You're going to do, do some ministry. And God says, Rob, I know it's hard for you to talk. I know you'd rather sit over here over to the side, but, but Rob, I gotta send you. You're, you're not gonna be the person I need you to be if I don't. I know sometimes you cry at night, sometimes, but Rob, I gotta send you because, you, because I have something big, big for you, and but but you're not gonna achieve it if I don't send, send you. Do, do you guys have a PP like that that was so hard that you can see God just do it? Doing some amazing things, man. And and then, guys, I got the other piece. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but about eight years ago, God says, "Hey, Rob, I need you to start to create theological courses because in five years, I'm going to have pastors in the Philippines and in Africa and in Canada who's going to need this." And I'm like, "Okay, Lord." Okay, can I go? I mean, I'll, 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 I'll do it. Then I got the other piece. I call it my, my boys. Man, I love them to death. Y'all have no idea. If it was not for them, I would probably work myself to death. Before them, like, guys, I would read, like, five, six hours a day. A month. But, but they have caused me to really re- reflect and to enjoy life. Then I got the other piece. About five, six years ago, God says, hey, you, 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 you know what, Rob? I'm going to send you to the black church. I know you know nothing about that, and I know you're going to make mistakes, but, but there's this guy over there. His name is Howard Wills, and my hand is upon him, and I just want you to do whatever he says. So that's what I've tried to do. Uh, but, but, guys, all these key pieces, we, you got pieces, I got pieces, we all got pieces. Don't, 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 don't we? And we understand what God is doing. We, we understand what God is doing. But guys, I got this piece. It's always in my desk. I try to move it, it comes back. And it's not like the other pieces, is it? Man, be because it's always there. I try to fit it into my puzzle. It doesn't fit into my puzzle. And I'm wondering, Lord, how is this going to fit? Because right now, it. It, 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 it don't fit. I call mine my um, the three-year-old piece. I've had it for three years, and it just didn't fit into my puzzle. Do you have a piece like that? Do you have a piece where it just doesn't seem to fit into your puzzle? You know what you do with a piece like that? You put it to your hand. You, you fold it up. You fall on your knees and say, Lord, help me understand this piece. And you don't stop. This is the piece that you are... This is the piece that you are a, a, a that you just don't quit in. This is the piece you say, Lord, and F, you don't stop. Every time it comes to your mind, Lord, here it is again. You, you got to give me clarity, and, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing when we are a, a persistent in prayer. Things we don't understand, things we need the Lord for, and we say, God, help me. 
Wow, that's just my first point. Wow. Uh, um, next, when we, when we walk in our victory, not only must we trust in God's power, but we must trust in God's you know, protection. Not only must we trust in God's power, but we must trust in His you know, protection. God is not only all powerful, but, but He is also all love loving. It, it doesn't matter. Guys, it doesn't matter. If God is all the power, but, but He doesn't love me to, to the degree to save me, God doesn't. It doesn't matter. This is what separates us from every other in the religion is that we believe that God is all powerful and He's all love loving. If there's a boulder flying at me, it doesn't matter if God has the power to stop it and don't. God doesn't. No. God's got to get in front of get in front of the boulder. And this is what we believe. This is how we are victorious. This is how we remain victorious in this Christian life. And we hold on to it. And, and we never let go. We never let go to what God can and will do. The first thing we learn about God's protection is that it is a, um, a providential Hook with me in verse 7. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. God's, God's protection is providential. Now, providential is, a, it is a, um, a, what we call it a, um, a theological word. What that means is that you're not going to find this word in your Bible. So uh, when, when you're rereading and you're wondering, Hey, because they talked talked about providence, and you're trying to find it in your Bible, you're just not going to find it. But we come up with words that can describe what God's word says, and, 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 and then that's what providence is. There are other words like a um, trinity and all, all, all this other stuff that that you won't find in your Bible. But but it doesn't mean they're not true. Um, let me give you a definition for providence. Providence is God watching and directing the affairs of our lives in such a way that we accomplish everything that God intends to fulfill His purpose for our lives. Providence is when you leave the keys in your door and you go to bed and you're still alive. That's what providence is. God had made it such that no one would break into your house and kill you or do do whatever. God's the one. That's providence. Providence is when... You are in your car, and you're driving, and you got your phone up, and a car just misses you, and you know what God God did? It just, God just pushed it aside. That's providence. We, we all know about the things that God is doing in providence. Guys, and this, this idea that you preserve me from trouble, it's this idea of God not allowing you to be so overtaken so pinned back and so overwhelmed by what, what's going on. That is what God's protection is for. Second, the other thing that God's protection is, it's personal. In every clause of this verse, man, in the first clause, you are a hiding place for me. Second clause, you, you preserve me. God, you surround me. The psalmist believes. The psalmist believes that whatever situation God, he is in, God will protect him. Whatever situation you are in, God will protect you. Whatever it is, it's personal. It's personal because God loves you. God loves you to such a degree that he's got some great things for you, each one of you. God's got great things for each one of you. Whatever we need at the hour that we need it, God will give it. So that you will be the victorious in everything that God wants you to. Third, God provides His presence for victory. 
And the text says, you surround me. Man, God is encircling you in your trouble. When, when I think of what God is doing in my life, and I'm like, and when, when I'm going through the trouble, God hasn't abandoned you. He's right there with, with you. He's encircling you. This is a guarantee for his utter de- for his utter presence in your life in whatever situation that God brings brings you through. God, the Lord addresses our hardship by working on our inside so we can be transformed on the outside. So we can live with a renewed perspective and be a witness to, to, to and be a witness to to this lost world. So when you're going, pulling through, and it, it's just hell. I mean, everything is coming down, and then the your and then the your the coworker comes comes to you and says, "Why aren't you depressed? Why aren't you depressed? Why aren't you mourning?" And then you have the opportunity to talk on how great Jesus is, and you can share Jesus with them. So this couple brings home a baby. Verse 9, the baby cries, and the husband reaches out, touches his wife, and she goes and gets the baby. baby. Uh, second night, same thing. He reaches over, and he reaches over, and then the she one looks at him. But, but she goes. Third night, same thing. Baby cries. He re- reaches out. By, by this time, she was furious. And then the, she turns to him and she says, "How are we both on a on a on a on a on a on a maternity leave, and you don't get get up once? I need you to get get up, take care of the baby." And and then he goes. He takes care of the baby. The baby's crying, and then he feeds him, rock, rocks him, and then he goes to bed. Thirty minutes later, later the the the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the baby cries again. So he goes in and he goes and takes care of the baby. It's around six o'clock and, and and then she wakes up, but her husband isn't in the bed and she don't think anything of it. He's probably downstairs or he's with the baby or something. Something. But the first thing she does, the first thing she does, of course, she goes into the room, right? She opens the door. She cannot believe her eyes. The husband had crawled in the bed, and the bed was not collapsing. Isn't this what God does with us? He doesn't take us out of the crib of our trouble. He don't take us out. No, he crawls into the crib of our trouble, and it should make the eyes of our heart just get so big that God would want to come in my trouble. See, because sometimes that we do some crazy things, and, and sometimes that we do some mad, messy things. But God, but but God still, He never abandons us. He won't abandon you. He won't abandon you in what way? And ever trust trouble that that you have. He 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 will never abandon you. Brother and sister, I'm here to tell you in. To whatever your child trouble is, God will provide it. Well, whatever it is that you need, God will provide it. If it's a uh, if, if if it is a um, more of a um, financial tr- trouble, he he's gonna work work out the details. He's gonna find a way to bring some, some something that that you don't have. If your trouble is um, a relational, he's gonna fix it, or he's gonna give you something new. Uh, if it's spirit, spirit, spiritual, if a, uh, it, if you are experiencing the the uh, the onslaughts of a uh, Satan, he going to protect you and give you what what you need. He going to give you a word, a psalm, a hymn, and, and he going to give you something to get through it. When we walk in your, when we walk in our victory, not only must we trust in God's power. Not only must we trust in His protection, 
but we must trust in his guidance or discipleship. Discipleship is how God turns our failure into victory. It's how we can see our greatest failures, our greatest failures. God has some, something already worked out in his re, 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 redemptive plan for our lives. Discipleship is when you walk with another individual so they can grow in their trust and reliance on Christ. Our text gives... Uh, first, I want to address um, that the scholarship is uh, a lot of times split on who is the I. There is God, David, and all... And then a third one is what we call is the director of new music. So the one who is uh, I- I- issuing in uh, the uh, psalm. But but I really uh, but I want to give you two examples of guys who had a, a um, and I disagreed on this text. And I just can't throw these guys at you. Um, you, you really got to know who they are. I'm going to really try to not may make this boring, boring, but but we got John Calvin and Charles Spurgeon. Man, I can't tell you. John Calvin, ain't nobody bad better in the 15th century. So, John Calvin, Lord, help me. Wow. Uh, John Calvin writes his day off in the Institutes of Christian Religion in about 1536. This is the most significant Theological work ever produced in a um, a Christendom. Nothing touches it. Everybody from then on, every uh, every single a um, systematic theology from then is resting on the shoulders of John Calvin. Guys, guess what? He did very pretty. Oh my goodness! Young people, please, young people, don't ever think God can't do great things through you. Don't ever think. John Calvin did did this before he was 25. If he did that before he was 25, what would he do? Oh, my goodness. Uh, John Calvin wrote commentaries on virtually every book of the Bible, except for Revelation and Daniel. While, while, while he was preaching and lecturing two, three times a day, Man, Calvin is committed to the Word of God. Calvin is committed, and he's willing to die. There's a situation in the um, Geneva, so he's in a uh, so uh, he's in the um, Geneva, France, and there's this group called the uh, um, Libertines. This is a heretical group, to say the least. So they found a way to um, twist twist the um, scriptures that included wife shame. So they come in, and Calvin is a um, Calvin is a um, distributing the Lord's table. Calvin knows what they do, and they come in and they're walking down. We don't care what Calvin says; we're going to take our communion. Calvin, as they're walking down, Calvin says, "I will not give holy things to the profane." He turns around. Lord, help me here. Help me portray this how it really was. Calvin, he turns around and no, he's protecting the holiness of Christ, and he covers, he covers the elements, and he says as he's going down, you're going to have to kill me. This is Calvin. He's committed to the Word of God, man, and he's willing to die. Then, then you got, oh my goodness, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon is the Prince of Prince Preacher. Guys, Charles Spurgeon is beast. Nobody in the 18th century wins more to Christ than Charles Spurgeon. He's winning so many to Christ. He's winning so many to Christ that he tells his church members, stop coming to church. So, so lofty to say. Man! He's got nearly 3,000 sermons. It's like 2,864. I'm close. But, man, and gosh, Cal- Spurgeon will drop a mic in a minute. 
So he's over here in a, um, London. He finds out what's going on in America uh, with the uh, um, the Southern Baptists. He calls them out. They want to kill him. They burn all of his books in in one newspaper. In one newspaper, they say, if Spurgeon comes to America, we're leaving him for dead. This is the prince of preachers whose God's spirit is on. Sin has no bounds. Sin has no bounds. These are these two guys. Man, my first three years as a Christian, they were my food. They really were. <laughs> um, but these guys, I, I say all that because I just can't tell, tell you, well, well, Calvin and Spurgeon, they were committed to what they believed in, and they had a um, that disagreed on this text. Calvin says it's da- 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 David. Spurgeon says it's God. Man. And where I fall, that, that I see verses 1 and 2 as an ideal, and verses 3 and 5 is more of my, my fail, fail your life. Like I said earlier, life hits. We don't always do what we should do. We don't always do what we should do. And then I see in 6, it's just this, it's just this progression of, of, of relying on God and we're relying on what He can and will do. If you tell me, Rob, you're, you're wrong, I'm like, okay. Uh, because for, for, for me, it's not a gospel issue. I don't have to agree with everybody. I know that I don't agree with everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, so that that's kind, kind of where I fall. And this text gives us some guidelines. It, it really does give us some guidelines how we can see God turn our victory or, or turn our failure into victory. Uh, read with me in verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will count count closely you with my eye upon you. First, in order to be the victorious in discipleship, it must be intentional. There's a clear goal in mind when we are walking with somebody. That goal is for them to walk with wisdom. We want... We, when you are a... Uh, we, when you are a, a, a when you are um, walking with somebody, you, you want them to glorify Christ in their life, and and you want them to grow into a um, the maturity. Second, in order to be victorious in discipleship, it must be authoritative. What it means is that they see you as some type of a um, expert. That they've seen your life, and it's like wow, that that. And the first thing that they see is, hey, you got something I don't. You got something I don't. And I really want what which you have. So, 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 but then that they trust and will rely on your God, 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 guidance to help them through. Guys, transformation does not happen by accident. It really doesn't. It does not happen by, by accident. We have, transformation happens. As we put structures in place, transformation happens as we put stru- structures. So when they could have failed, they didn't. And the only reason we we know when they could have failed is because that we walked where they walked. And we might have failed in, in most of the time that we did. So we know what to do. We, we know what to do. We, we know what things to be put, put in place so that everybody grows in into the maturity of Christ. This, this is what we, we are called to do. Discipleship is coming full circle with your victory. Any personal bit of victory that you get are for you. But as you walk with somebody else, that's how we grow the king kingdom. That's really how we grow the king kingdom. So if I struggle with a sin, and I don't help nobody. I'm not. All, all, all I am is helping myself. And Christ calls us to reach out. Christ calls us to reach out to those who are hurting and helpless. And those, and, and, and we do our best to lead, lead them into God's ways. The 
discipleship. Guys, I can't push this enough. Discipleship is how we create meaning in our lives and we fulfill the Great Commission. Discipleship. Discipleship is everything. Discipleship is how we move from being self-centered to other-centered. As we become more other-centered, we find God's purpose in our lives. We find His purpose as we forget about our own uh, comfortability and, and we don't care about what we have to go through, but, but we're all about the kingdom and, and we are all about re- reaching out and helping others. Here's a quote. Um, Dr. King, in, in his sermon on, a, uh, on a, uh, the three dimensions of a complete life, said this. In order to live a, a, a creative and a, a, a meaningful life, our self-concern must be a, a wedded with the, a, a self-concern of others. That means someone else's, someone else's a, a, their victory is tied to your victory. They become the victorious as you walk with other people. Your victory will become more like Christ. Your victory will become more and more like Christ and help others to do the same. As, guys, as we walk in discipleship, as we do this, we prevent sorrows. We prevent needless pains that don't need to happen. And others, and as we walk in discipleship, Guys, as we walk in discipleship, others get to experience the love of Christ. And they get to walk in that light and understand what God is doing. My question to you, who do you need to disciple? You're, you're either in one of two categories. You're one who needs to be discipled. Or you're going to be the one who would go wouldn't be doing the, 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 the discipling, man. You're you're either in one one or two. Do you have a coworker that you I uh, started to encounter and you're, you're like, hey, cause I can really help them. A, a long lost friend, guys. I really want to push this. And if we just imagine this. Say there are a, um, 50 people here, and I don't know, but if there are 50 people and we disciple just one, just one, just one is all I'm asking. And if they disciple, and the people that we disciple, if they just did disciple one, that's 2,500 people. Man, we can change this community through discipleship. We have all these things that are going on in our community and and the gospel is the only answer. The gospel is the only answer. And, And if we get serious about discipleship, if we get rock hard serious, man, there ain't anything we can do God can do anything. He's got all the power. He's already guaranteed us the victory. Christ has all authority. He's already with, with us. There ain't anything Satan can do. Guys, my, my plea, my plea to each one of us is do, do the mission of the church. Do the mission of the church. And by that, that we we will understand God's mission and God's plan for our lives. And we get to grow the king kingdom and we get to bring a little bit of heaven now. Man, a little bit of heaven so that they can see and taste that the Lord is good and they can see of what a eternity with Christ will be like. That's my plea. Would you join me? 
wouldn't you join me in doing the Great Commission and making the disciples? That's all I have. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will experience virtually or for anyone that may be in the sanctuary this morning to give you this opportunity to make a decision in your life to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We offer Christ to you, my sister and my brother, for only Jesus Christ has the power to save and to forgive. Only Jesus Christ has the power to wash and cleanse us from all of our sins. He does it for our past, He does it for our present, and He does it for our future. If you're there or if you are present here this morning and don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll never Confess your sins to Him. The sin of, that we need forgiveness for and of. You need not confess that to me, but we need to only confess our sin to God. If I have the power to forgive sin, I may be prejudiced in who I forgive. But we serve a God who is not prejudiced. He will forgive anyone and everyone who come to him 
in repentance and confessing, begging and asking Him to forgive us of all of our sins. Can't nobody do that but God. Will you trust Him today? Only He has the power to do that. And when the Lord saves you, when the Lord forgives you, He provides divine protection for you. If you're saved, the Bible says, those whom my Father have given unto me, He says, I keep them. Satan himself cannot put them out of my hand. Once you're saved, you are secure. That's protection. Satan cannot take you out of the Father's hand. Salvation, Satan don't have the power to take it away from you. And I often say, if he didn't give it, he can't take it away. If you're here today, if you're there, man, woman, boy, or girl, don't know Christ, Jesus as your personal Savior. Would you trust Him today? Would you trust Him today? He will save you. He will protect you. He will keep you. And then He will make you a disciple. You have a bad case of the King's help. If the Lord saved you from your sin, you'll be ready and willing to run swiftly to tell somebody else. You may not know all of the Bible, but certainly you know how to tell somebody how God saved you. If you're here or if you're there today, we invite you to come. We invite you to come. We invite you to come. If you're here this morning and you're one of those that need forgiveness of your sins, if you are a sinner, you need forgiveness. And only Jesus can do it. If you hear what you come, we invite you to come. We invite you to come. Those of you in the house standing next to somebody, do this real quick. This is a discipleship act. Just turn to the person next to you and ask them, are you saved? Be sure you get an answer. Are you in the kingdom of God? Did everybody get a yes answer? If you got a no answer from anybody, God wants you to witness to that person. And just to remind them that you can be saved before you leave here. Not asking you to join this church, but I am inviting you into the kingdom of God. If there is one that you receive the no answer to, say, Look, I can walk down with you, but you have to make the decision. The Spirit is calling, the Spirit is drawing you to the Father. Would you obey Him and come if you are here? Oh, Father, how we thank you for your love for us. Father, how we thank you for your grace toward us. Thank you that you are not just a loving Father, but you are a forgiving Father. And you do it unconditionally. We pray now, God, that you will continue to strengthen us. Continue to protect us. Continue to give us the power that we need to defeat the enemy of our soul. Then, Father, we pray that in recognizing your total and complete presence with us, God, we pray that we would know that you have given us the power to witness to those who are yet lost in their sins, to know that the power of God can draw them to the Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and take your seat for a moment and give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Reverend Peters, uh, for the message on this morning. Amen. Uh, can somebody testify with us? 
Did somebody testify this morning that God has the power? God has the power. Amen. Grateful. 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 And God has, he provides the protection. Amen. At this time, I'm going to give way. Uh, if anyone dropped some keys or a key on a key chain in the parking lot, if these belong to you, they will be up front.